hello. Thanks for coming. And um, yeah, let me have a chat about this biodynamic craniosacral therapy. And um, I'll show a whole bunch of slides, not too many, but enough. And inevitably, there'll be a whole mix of images, though. A lot of them will probably be anatomy images. Uh, but I'll try and explain them. And um, I'll try and, you know, talk about what exactly is this therapy and uh, what are the, what's the paradigm behind it. Okay. Great. So there's kind of where uh, the whole journey started which was uh, probably about 100 years ago. This, this therapy in various forms has been around for some time, actually. And um, the originator of the work is uh, a guy called Dr. Sutherland, who was a, one of the earliest osteopaths. So he was an American, studied with uh, Andrew Taylor Still, who's um, the founder of osteopathy. So we're going back some time, turn of the... 19th, 20th century, um, and that's when he was a student, and he had a few moments, eureka moments, around the human body, but to cut a long story short, he got interested in all of these, which are these kind of unique ways that the cranial bones come together, the joints. And joints in, you know, quite a, quite a different way to joints in the rest of the body. You can see they're quite flat, aren't they? And they're quite unusually shaped, they're quite irregular shaped. And actually it doesn't show the top of the head, but the top of the head's got this kind of thing going on, which is like comb-like structures coming together from uh, the two major bones of the crown. So I assume uh, he just went, wow, this is interesting, how does that work? How do, why is this a jigsaw puzzle? Why is it like that? I think anybody would want to ask that question. You know, you could come up with other designs for this, couldn't you? Like, um, just to make it all bone. Why bother with all these little sections? You could, you could say that, couldn't you? You, you? you could make it in three bits, so who knows what. But it comes in lots of bits. I can't remember how many, but there's a lot. If you include the facial bones, you've got, you must be up to, let, let me guess, 40, 50 something like that, and the number of joints is considerable. So it is literally a mosaic, it's a jigsaw coming together in particular ways, and it really does interlock in particular ways. He had a whole moment around this bone where he thought that it uh, looked like a gill of a fish. Well, fair enough, I mean, if you're going to have gills, they're going to be somewhere down here or up there, aren't they? That's kind of where you'd stick them. And um, he basically started to experiment on himself, like any, you know, great pioneer. And what he, what he came up with was, basically, the cranium is on the move. It's not a static structure, which is generally assumed in most anatomy understandings and most sciences. Actually, these bones are in very subtle, constant motion. And uh, he noticed that the, this whole structure here, the temporal bone, which is in white, actually has a motion that goes like this. It's subtly doing that. Yeah, it's kind of opening out laterally to the sides. And then it's, it's kind of moving medially. And, um, you know, these are micro movements. It takes some time to be able to feel these movements, the subtle uh, little motions that are running in the body, in the background of the body, behind the physiology and uh, within the structural continuity of the body. But what he, what he found was these movements are completely consistent with the body's uh, mechanical relationships so that the temporal bones just can't pop out any old way they can only move in accordance with the uh, neighbours and the kinds of joint relationships they have. So, basically, you can't really see it so easily from here, but this bone here, this portion of the bone is sat on top of that bone. Yeah, so you've got this kind of thing going on. Like plates in the air. Absolutely. 
I mean, they're like tectonic plates. Lots of tectonic plates do that, but they also buckle a bit, but they also override. Exactly that. So they, this overrides and sits on top of that, and this does the opposite. You can't see it so easily, but the parietal bone here is sat on top of that, so there's a bit of a transition here in the joint beveling, which produces this joint that's going at that angle and then switches to that angle. So basically, this portion is the only portion of the bone that can move laterally. Yeah? This portion here, as that moves laterally, moves medially. So it goes like that because it's pivoting at that place. So here's the movement, like that. This portion here is moving towards each other. These two bits are moving away. Yeah? So basically, there's some subtle motion expression taking place in the cranial bones in accordance with the laws of mechanics and joint relationships. And all of these, basically he tracked all of these structures. And because he was an osteopath from his, the early tradition of the work, his orientation was here. Yeah, so the whole of the osteopathic science originated from a relationship to this. So if you can organize and adjust and uh, move through uh, restrictions in the axis of the body, then the rest of the body will fall into place. So his emphasis was on the cranium and the vertebral column. So his initial explorations were all around that. Uh, so basically he spent time tracking all of these subtle movements, not just in the cranium and the cranial bones, but also in the vertebral column and in all the structures that were in and around it. So all the ligaments and membranes and fluids, there's a fluid in here, and the central nervous system too. So the original work has come from a uh, exploration of all of this. Uh, he called the movement primary respiration because he felt like it was some kind of subtle breathing that was moving through the body and that um, in a way the body was being breathed by some deeper force. And as he started to uh, uh, have an exploration internally, what he noticed to his surprise, I think, was that Actually, what seemed to be moving all these structures was a fluid fluctuation along the center, central axis of the body, meaning cerebrospinal fluid, which is in blue here, there's a volume of it which runs through the cranium and down through the spinal cord, is moving in a fluctuant motion. And he noticed it was moving at particular tempos up and down the center line of the body. And um, in order to express this motion, the body accommodated it by, accommodates it by shifting and changing its structure. So there's a synchrony between this fluid movement and the bony shifts and changes that are taking place around all the sutures. So basically, what he uh, felt was that the head is actually morphing very subtly in all kinds of shapes. So actually, it seems to be making a kind of widening and a narrowing movement. As it widens, it narrows front to back. As it narrows side to side, it expands front to back. So there's an interesting sort of morphic shifting that's going on. And within all that, individual structures are making particular movements around joints, which we, do, which we just looked at with the uh, cranial bones. So, interesting. Uh, plus, uh, not just the bones are moving in this primary respiratory motion, but all the structures of the midlife, all the structures of the body are moving in response to it. And uh, even the central nervous system. 
which we can see here, the brain and the cord have a particular kind of movement which is consistent with this fluctuant shift along the axis of the body. Um, he noticed that there was something driving it, some subtle force within the fluids of the central nervous system, and he called this the breath of life, that it was some kind of uh, intangible, subtle life force that was moving the fluid system in the core of the body, and that in turn was moving the structures of the body. So how was he experimenting with that? He started experimenting on his own. I think he devised a whole bunch of sort of, uh, you know, sort of rope and tackle devices, which would uh, actually, what he, what he did for a while was limit the movement of some of the bones, so he clamped them on his head thinking that, well, if there is motion here and I'm preventing it, what will happen? And I think after a while of doing that, he started becoming a little bit psychotic and he got, got lots of emotional, you know, expressions coming through. And, I, you know, so, so, so it became too much for his system. And then a, a lot of what he's discovered has come from touch. So palpating, touching his clients, uh, I think he used to do osteopathic adjustments and at the end of the session he'd sit holding them initially in a cranial hold and he'd listen to their systems and uh, notice what came up. Have you mentioned before that osteopathy has been in recent addition to health, so essentially osteopathy came just before this kind of... No, this came out of osteopathy. So this has come from osteopathy, the osteopathic tradition and as um, I'm surprised how young osteopathy is. Well, next to other things, certainly it is. I mean, what is it, a hundred and odd years old? It's, it, it, it's, is that young? I suppose it is. Next to some of the traditional medicines, it is, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. There were other things, yes, certainly. I mean, obviously the whole Chinese medicine goes back a, a long way, doesn't it? I mean, uh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Well, osteopathy is thought to have come out of bone setting, the whole Irish tradition around that. Yeah, so something he's come out of something that's been around for a while. Um, mo all the uh, osteopaths. I mean, North American osteopaths are medical doctors too. So I think it's you know. It's, in a way, interesting it's come out of osteopathy because what it's brought with it, there's a subtle energetic something running here, but what it's brought along with the science of osteopathy is an appreciation of the body's anatomy and physiology and the body mechanics. And uh, what's kind of developed within the craniosacral field is this interesting uh, merging of a energetic, subtle... A process that's taking place in the body and this kind of real solid orientation to the body's anatomy, which is, you know, made it an intriguing science, I think. Um, so for a long time, it remained part of the osteopathic community. There, there were a particular kind of osteopaths who called themselves cranial osteopaths. And I think they were slightly fringy within the osteopathic community for a long time. Uh, because they were doing something that was strange, really. It's quite different than mainstream osteopathy. Initially, all the contacts were actually quite strong. You know, the early cranial contacts were quite powerful and there were, there, there were forceful adjustments that they were bringing into play. And then, as things have kind of uh, carried on, the contact has got subtler and subtler because actually you don't need to make those strong adjustments. And sometime in the 80s, the uh, cranial osteopathy started to be taught to non-osteopaths. So people initially who were in other bodywork fields and didn't have an osteopathic background because uh, actually what you needed was sensitivity and an understanding of the body. So that's not just 
the osteopaths. And since then, there's been two streams of uh, this science. One has been within the osteopathic community. The other one is craniosacral therapy. So it's kind of renamed because craniosacral therapies are not necessary osteopaths. And so there's been a development since then in uh, two, two particular therapies. Um, let's have a look here. Um, here's a, I mean, craniosacral therapy is a fluid-based therapy. And um, it started off as an exploration of fluids in the core and fluids in the core of the brain. This is where cerebral spinal, spaces, cerebral spinal fluid spaces are. Uh, but in the biodynamic approach, it's become much more an orientation to the whole body of fluids. And how much fluid are we? I mean, it's somewhere around 75%, I think, at the moment. Depends who you read. So what we notice in sessions, and we all notice this, is that you can contact somebody, and I'll, I'll do a demonstration later, if you, if you wish. Um, is you contact somebody, at some point in the session, there's this interesting shift between the body being quite a physical, structural entity, there's a feeling of the body being physical and there's lots of structural shifts and changes going off, to what feels like, say I'm holding the head, the head melts in your hand, it feels like it's dissolving and going soft, and you make this perceptual shift to the head feeling like it's actually something that's full of water and the body goes the same way. It's like the, the, the body drops into its underlying element and suddenly the whole body is very fluid and amorphous. And then the therapeutic process takes on a slightly different flavour in that state. But that's interesting, isn't it? Because actually what structure is, is fluid, isn't it? You know, this thing we call physical, the hard stuff, if you actually have a look inside it, it what, what is it? Cells, isn't it? Yeah, I mean cells are just the membranes with fluid inside and surrounded by fluid, aren't they? That is mostly, it's curious, it feels hard. I've, I, I'm, I'm still coming to terms with that. But I think what happens in the session is the body drops into that underlying state. And it's then you can get a very strong sense of this primary aspiration, this uh, subtle movement that's taking place. Um, there's a I mean, what, there's a training in sensitivity and through touch. That's, the, that, that's what's been promoted in the therapy. In order to be able to feel these subtle motions, that's what's required. Plus, it's not just about that. What we're sensing is the body and the nuances of the body so that you can touch the body and even though you're not in immediate relationship with something you can still get a sense of it so you can put your hands here and you can start to differentiate how the brain is so you can start to get a sense of how the cerebellum is it's got a shape to it it's got an activity, it's got a particular tone. Same with the brainstem, even though you're touching here, you can form a relationship to deep structures and you can, let's say listen, it's a word we use a lot, even though we're using our hands, you can listen to how they are, how they're functioning, what's going on within them. So today, in the uh, seminar that I'm running here, we spent some time listening to the brainstem and the cerebellum and this space here. Yeah, there's the fluid space here called the, the uh, fourth ventricle. And we also listened to a particular strip of nuclei in the brainstem that run along its length called the reticular formation. Yeah, so through touch, you can form a relationship to quite precise and distinct structures deep to your hands. That's fascinating, isn't it? That is quite remarkable. Yeah? And not only that, they can change. 
So the brainstem can uh, shift and uh, resolve its state. These are tissues, so they can adjust. And um, brainstems can regulate and perhaps come out of all kinds of nervous loops or who knows what. Same goes for the rest of the brain. You can feel all these different parts and there's obviously lots of bits to it. And you know what, you don't need to put your hands here. You can put your hands anywhere in the body and feel it. Yeah, so there's a tremendous development of felt sense awareness. That's what's being um, generated in the learning of this work. Uh, so the first point of call is to become sensitive to your own system. So it's a training in becoming highly attuned to your body and the nuances of your body, so to drop into an embodied state of presence within yourself, because only then can you actually feel how somebody else is. Yeah, that, that, that's fairly reasonable, isn't it? If, you're, if, if you can be in a, a, an exquisite relationship with your own structure, then you can recognize it in somebody else. And if you're not, you can't recognize it in somebody else. That's what shows through. Well, that also means your structure is not in a way it shows. Yeah. Form, yeah. It could be like that, or it could disrupt your ability to uh, perceive. Like a tuning fork. Yes. I mean, what, uh, felt sense awareness is, a, is, is the, a relationship to our general senses, which is our biggest sensory. Uh, system. It's way bigger than the eyes or the ears or all the special senses. And that's located through the whole, mostly through the connective tissue system of the body. Yeah, so you've got a huge amount of sensory ability here. Now, if you, what you're saying is true. If you've got a disruption in that, there's something that's uh, strained or restricted or who knows what, it can affect your ability to therefore sense. So a lot of the training is A, coming into your felt sense awareness and B, resolving anything that's running in that. Yeah, so the whole therapy has become extremely interested in trauma and trauma resolution because what seems to happen is uh, it, it, it begins to percolate up through the person's system in the session. And the body goes into a process uh, around that. So the body tries to make a, a shift and change around it. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So, um, as we enter mindless, this conversation happens, yes. if there's a fault in your own system, yes. Okay. And um, I, I guess I, I would be interested in this area of kind of having health in your system and being resolved in your system and being in a state of health, but also seeing something imperfect in your body and kind of like. Yes. You know, because like you're saying, to be able to listen and to have a therapeutic relationship with someone else seems to be resolved in your system, but does that mean you need to be in a state? <laughs> yeah, I do see what you mean. Yeah, no, it doesn't. No, thank goodness, because I'd be out for a kickoff, you know. I, know, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't perceive myself to be ill. It's more yes. the nature of a physical disability. Yeah. But it's like, it, in, I've been reading a bit about this, and, you know, the sort of the breath of life and, how, you know, how we go things yes. on a deep level could affect everything. Else. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question because I think there's uh, levels of resolution. And what, what I notice is uh, when people come into the learning of this and into the training, uh, the body needs to resolve often around certain aspects of their system which do seem to be powerfully getting in the way 
of perception. Now, we'll always have, we'll always be trying to optimize. I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect system. That's just a, a wrong notion. So the whole, no, the, the whole idea of homeostasis is right. So we'll always try to optimize to the highest level we can. Now, there seems to be a certain point where there's enough freedom in your system to be able to fully open up to the perceptual abilities. And yes, okay, I've got stuff going off in my body, but it's not enough to interfere with that. And you start to learn how to, despite your condition, you can form a relationship to your health, the forces of health in your system, which is so big that conditional forces are that big. And I think this is what runs very powerfully in this therapy. So a biodynamic craniosynthetherapy is, is mostly interested in somebody's health. And, you, and actually, you've got to learn to relate to that, because I don't think we're very good at relating to it. Now, once you can do that, all hell lets loose. The body just, get, just, just starts uh, shifting and changing and alters its condition. Uh, you know, now, if you can do that as a therapist, if you can be in relationship to your health, your conditional forces will become much lower key. They won't be governing how you are. When you say it's in relation to your health or the other person's health, you mean as opposed to their illness? Yes, yeah. That's right. I mean, basically... That's right. Yeah, I, I really love this therapy for its uh, acknowledgement of health. So you put your hands on somebody and you go, hello, health, how are you doing? Yeah, and you don't want to ignore the uh, illness or the condition because that's, that, that, that's not right, is it? So then you say hello to that as well. Now, training yourself to do that takes some doing because it's coming out of a pathological mindset and it's coming out of a what's wrong here mentality and can I fix it mentality, can it be fixed and what's wrong rather than uh, actually I'm listening to what's right, there's so much order in your system that it's staggering, you're not atomizing, your cells are communicating powerfully, actually what's going on mostly even in the most extreme illness is health there's balance going on. Okay, somebody's riddled with cancer, somebody's got some dreadful neuropathy, there is still tremendous health forces there. Now, if you can form a relationship to that, what that seems to do is remind the body that it actually has got tremendous potential and something gets generated in the touch around that. Plus, you're doing it through touch. How powerful is touch? Yeah, it's kind of huge, isn't it? I think we might have forgotten how powerful it is as adults. But there's something incredibly primal about contact, which is really explored as well. So I was thinking of what you were saying, that maybe, maybe what isn't it something the body can actually exactly as it could be? Yeah. Well, what Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I sit there day in, day out, I'm sure you do as, as well, Claire. Uh, being an ob observer of somebody's body, yeah, the biodynamic approach is to be neutral and to wait, in a way, create a facilitated space and the right contact. And then you sit back with, with an informed touch, of course, and you wait for the body to go about its own internal shifting and changing. And really, you observe the body just unfolding and, and running through a whole series of uh, adjustments in front of you. The body adjusts itself. And I don't mean little fine adjustments. I mean vertebra doing this. Yeah, I mean, bones making big movements, clunks happening in the body. Yeah, yeah. Facilitating self yes, exactly that. And, and, and that's exactly what goes on. When you make that relationship to the forces of health, they get generated uh, in the client system. 
Here's another aspect of the work. There's lots of aspects, but I'll talk about some of them. Here's a lovely one which uh, Sutherland observed these structures. I don't know if you know much about these, but the large connective tissue structures in the cranium, they're big, aren't they? Look at this here, it's huge. It's like a big internal Mohican, isn't it? And this here has been cut away, but really it's like two wings or a diaphragm. And obviously the brain sits in here, that's been removed, and the brain is in a way supported by the, this thick, uh, it's, it's, it's the outer meningeal layer called the dura mater. And I don't know if you can get a sense of it, but can you see the floor and the sides of the cranium and how they flow into these structures? The, there's continuity. Basically, it's all formed out of one sheet. Yeah? And say you've got a balloon and you get your hands and push in like that. That's how those have been formed. And then you get your hands like this and push them down like that. That's how that's been formed. So you can see it's still one balloon. And then the balloon from here turns into a sausage balloon and goes all the way down to the sacrum. And then what sits in that is your spinal cord and brain. Now, what Sutherland uh, observed here was that there is a natural tensile quality to this membrane in health. So he called it membranous tension, which means that there is an organ, a membranous organ really, with a, in a particular kind of tautness, which in health is smooth and consistent throughout the whole of it. It's there as a shock absorber. Yeah, it's there as a container for the central nervous system. Now, you have a fall, you say you go, you're in a skiing, you, you're skiing and you fall on your coccyx, what about that one? That happens to so many people, doesn't it? And there's an impact into your coccyx. The, the dura mater will attempt to absorb that through the length and breadth of it, not just through the bit down there. It'll take it on as a whole structure and, and hopefully stop its momentum or absorb it and at least stop it coming through to the brain and the cord. That's the last place you want that to come through. So it is a shock absorber. And then perhaps in its system after that, there's some strain created by it. Yeah, you can get strain patterns in this collagen material. And perhaps, and then the practitioner comes along, touches you on your head and goes, oh, that's interesting. I'm listening to the dural membrane within you, which goes like that and like that, and because you're at one head and you can feel the whole of it, yeah? How can you feel the whole of that when you're just at one end of it? How, how actually can you do that? You, you can do that because it is one structure. It's not in bits. So the only, if you're truly listening to it, you will feel the whole of it. Or you'll feel as much of it as you can and there'll be some disruption in its tensile quality, say here, at this part, part of the vertebral column. And maybe beyond that you can't get a sense of, because there's been a disruption in the fabric of the dura mater. Now if you stay there and connect with it in this biodynamic way, you observe it starting to shift and change, because there's an urgency within it to come back to the wholeness of its entire structure. That's what it wants to do. So the body wants to come out of strain patterns. It's an effort to stay in them. And disruption is a communication breakdown, isn't it? Uh, so what he's bumped across here, he called this the reciprocal tension membrane system. What he's bumped across is something that runs through all connective tissues, not just this one. And how many connective tissues are in your body? Well, here's one, the, the skin. Yeah, there's so many membranes in the body. All the body is wrapped in some connective tissue. Every muscle you have, every joint capsule, every bone, every organ, they've all got a wrapping around them, the skin. 
basically. Now, if you can have an ability to relate to membranous tension or membranous quality, you can touch somebody at their feet and you can feel the whole of that fabric, which is actually most of who we are. Yeah? And within that fabric sit organs, bones, your brain, etc. Yeah? But it's within that template of this. And there is a tensile property within it. That's the nature of it. So you can touch somebody at their feet and go, oh yeah, there's your whole body. Or there's a lot of your body over there and a bit over there. But there's something over here which is a little bit like that. Yeah? Because the tensile property has changed over there. This bit over here, this leg here, feels nice and even and smooth, like it's all glidey and like a, a river. This bit here, around the knee there, it's like there's a rock, say. And you can feel it. So you can just touch somebody and go, yeah, that's easy, that's actually doing that. That bit over there is tight. That bit over there is feeling a bit nervous, nervy and so on. So you can start to develop this incredible ability to perceive through the lightest touch anywhere in your body. So what we're looking at here is a, a, a communication system to die for, really. And I think when we're in relationship to this, what, that's what I would call body intelligent. Yeah? You're in your own personal relationship to the whole network or stream of your connective tissue system, guess what runs through your connective tissues? Your vascular system, so your blood supply, your nervous system, so your whole nervous uh, shift and change and communication between muscles and glands and who knows what, and your lymphatic system. That's kind of huge, isn't it? So that's the relationship to most of who you are. So within your, when you're listening, yes. are you then able to find different layers of, say, old trauma? Yes. This new... Yes, and you can almost date it. Right. <laughs> yeah, nearly. I mean, what seems to happen is if you can have an embodied relationship to your own system and develop a touch, finesse, it's not anybody who can just do this. So you can, you, it needs to be, so, the body needs somebody to know. So it needs a knowing touch and a knowing presence. Only then will the body go, oh, okay, I've got a reflective ability. I've got, I'm, I'm getting a view about myself and then something kicks off around that. Now, if you're sat with that skill and you're, in a waiting mode, so you're not imposing an agenda on somebody going, yeah, that left hip's a bit skew whiff, and your vertebra are doing that rotation thing around wherever it is. Yeah, I'm going to go over there and start to derotate it. I mean, all good, all, all good reasons. If you back off from that and just wait, something gets generated in the system and what we call it is the inherent treatment plan or process. It starts to emerge and I tell you what, it's never as obvious as you think. So you're sat there holding someone's feet going, that's interesting about your hip and lower back and the body, given a chance, doesn't do anything with them. What it starts to do is something in the brainstem. It starts to kind of start firing up in the brainstem, maybe. I'm not, you know, I'm just, it's an example. And then something shifts around the top of the neck. Yeah, and then maybe the jaw does a bit of a shift and so on. And then something in the lumbar starts to change, the thing that you got a sense of. And it's like the body knows the combination sequence internally. And I think that's what explains why you can go for some therapeutic interventions and the damn thing keeps coming back, doesn't it? So you go with your lower back issue and every time it just keeps coming back, so you've got to go again and again and again. What we find in this therapy is that doesn't happen. And we think it's because the body 
goes about its own process of healing in, its, in the proper way, in a way you perhaps couldn't guess at, or you'd be lucky to guess at it. So that's what goes off. Yes. In terms of and exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and sometimes to the uh, uh, therapist, I can be sat there going, "Wow, that's interesting. I've no idea about that." Uh, so the body needs you to know enough to instigate that process, but you don't need to be knowing everything about the body. Yes. And so I receive information when I'm asked. Yes. So not just somebody comes in with a pain, but like you say, you might be working on something completely different. Yes. I'm not actually touching the body. I mean, how much are you? Able, can you split what it is you're receiving from the body and how much you're receiving intuitively? Or is it all? Well, I think what's I think I think what's getting unpacked is how we receive information in this therapy. So we talk endlessly about perception and perceptual fields and perceptual processes. Now how do we perceive? That's the, that's the strap line underneath biodynamic current cycle therapy in a way. So how do we do that through touch? Does it, yes, some of it comes to the mind in some interesting way, but lots of it comes to the body in all kinds of ways. So we listen, we're, li we're touching with our hands, but we're listening with the whole array of our systems. So I feel like I'm some huge satellite dish actually, hovering over somebody's system going, I'm listening, anything you want to say, you know what I mean? Uh, even though it might look from the outside like it's just my hands that are touching. So I think within all that exploration, you start to understand what intuitive means. That's what I've come to. I mean, what does that word mean, really? It's like, well, it comes to me somehow. I don't quite know how. You know, well, I think there are all kinds of ways which are explored within the therapy. It'd take me too long to talk about it, but that's what's kept me fascinated for a long time. How do we take in information? Yeah, now most of the information we take in is absolutely unconscious. 99.9% .9 really, isn't it? So it, it, it's absolutely huge. You know, we're doing something with each other all the time around sensing each other, all kinds of body messages going back and forth. And we're kind of up here on the top of all that really. So I think that's beginning to get unpacked with it, particularly in this biodynamic science because it's really gone to that place. So the last 20 years there's been an evolution in the work to the point where we're now saying we want to call ourselves something slightly different than craniosacral therapists. So we're going to stick a really big word in front of all those three big words and now call it biodynamic craniosacral therapy, meaning that we're not mechanically driven so we're not bringing intention to the system in lots of different ways that you can. We're literally sat back being perceptual therapists. We are touching and sensing and the process of that generates a powerful response in the system. Now back to your trauma question, so I didn't quite answer that. Basically what we notice when you do offer that Trauma starts to arise, so latent patterns in your body start to show themselves and reveal themselves. And I don't mean what you did yesterday, I mean something that's embedded within your body that could have come from who knows what. Some, well, in utero, we're noticing patterns from that far back. Uh, birth patterns, anything that's gone on for you when you were young any injuries, any kind of insults to the body, or that terrible thing that happened to you when your mother died and you were full of grief and weren't able to process the grief, etc. You know, there's, there's a thousand traumas out there, isn't there? And I'm sure we've experienced some of them. So some of those you resolve at the time, but some of them you don't and they stay 
in your system in some way, in the structure, in the physiology, you're changed by it. That's what pops out of these sessions. That's what the body's really interested in. It's not interested in that thing you did the other week. It's interested in what's been tying it up for 20 years and preventing the body from breathing properly. That's what comes up. So what we notice is A, it comes up very readily because you're relating to health. You relate to health and trauma starts to percolate up through the system and we notice too that it starts to resolve in a very easy managed way. Yeah, rather than coming through like uh, it's something that's unmanageable. So there's often a very smooth shift as trauma manifestations come. So the therapy's got less and less cathartic actually. It used to be quite cathartic back when I was learning it. Now it's not so the case. It's quite subtle actually. You know, someone's whole abuse trauma can arise and actually rather than it being some massive explosion in their system can actually get resolved in stillness. Why do you think that's different now? Well, I think the therapy has evolved this particular uh, orientation and, and, it, and, and, and previously it wasn't quite like that. So I'm saying this uh, particular approach here seems to do extremely well with safe and contained processes around uh, trauma resolution which is good news, really. And when that's happening, would the client be consciously aware of what it was? That was Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, it could be or could not be, but they'll certainly be aware of something moving in their system. So not necessarily no. what that No, that sometimes happened. not. Sometimes yes. It's not always necessary, actually. Yeah. But they'll feel a lot better afterwards. Yes, yes, exactly, because it uh, doesn't emerge again, or if it does emerge, it's, it's, a, it's a phantom of itself. It's less. There's less charge in the system. There's less physiological affect. That's how you know. Or that person can sleep through the night now, and for 20 years they've had insomnia. Or they can go out the front door without uh, being anxious or they can walk better, or the posture's better, you know. So yeah, it's measurable. So it's always, you know, it, it's obvious when something's shifted and changed. Or you don't get a headache anymore. Those migraines you've had for 20 years have gone. And you might not know the origin of it, you're right. Or you might, you might be, ah, you fell off your chair when you were six, you know. But that's where they stick it to a psychological Yeah. You don't necessarily need no. to know the No. And the therapist isn't necessarily interested in that. Yeah. They're only interested in it if it seems relevant for the body mm -hmm. to find that out. So sometimes people need to say something and then the body lets go of it. So as a client, your relationship to your quote problem is the sort of your chatter, your, your sort of like regular but kind of superficial relationship to it. And then, as you said, it could be anything. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. So, more structure. This therapy is interested in anatomy and structural detail. What I think has come together here is an energetic phenomenon with the body science. I thank God it came out of osteopathy, actually. It's produced something that's, I think, just really exquisite. So you can listen to somebody's liver you can feel the physiology going off under your hands. You can feel all the relationships that are across the body from the liver. And you can feel how it's subtly linking, linked to this kind of life force movement. Yeah, so that's, that's exquisite. Um, so there's this notion of midlines, a midline and um, Obviously, the structure of the body is very axial, isn't it? And everything hooks onto the um, vertebral column and so on. And you can feel this in lots of ways. So you can be 
We say we're interested in tissues, fluids, and potency. Potency is a term for breath of life in the fluids in the body. And it's like a kind of, well, it's like a prana, it's like a chi, it's like some vivacious life energy that's within the body, yeah, which is sustaining everything we think. So in a session, it's interesting, you can go from that right shoulder's feeling a little bit like that, your vertebra's telling me this, and so on and so on. You're in a, a, a touch anatomy world, to a fluid space, yeah, and everything's feeling very fluid like there's a whole body holisticness within that. The body's starting to shift and change in a much more amorphous capacity, and it can feel like the body's not only gone fluid inside itself, but it's gone fluid around it as well. It feels like the body's floating in a flotation tank, in a pool, yeah. And what we notice is primary respiration slows down as that happens. So when you're in a relationship to structure, it's moving quite rapidly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, something like that. When the body melts and shifts to its fluid state and expands, there's a sense of expansion, it slows down. So now it's going one, two, three, about twice as slow. That's intriguing, isn't it? The same movement of the breath of life has slowed down and you have gone through a perceptual shift. You're seeing the body differently from a different vantage point. Suddenly, all the particular relationships have dissolved. They've moved off. And now you're more interested in the holistic relationship that runs through the body and everything's gone from physical to fluid. And it literally feels like that. And the midline has gone from a structural midline to a fluid midline. It just feels like it's a fluid, you know, axis all of a sudden. And then something really interesting happens. If you start to get interested, the body starts to show you this potency aspect of itself, this breath of life within the fluid body, the fluid state dissolves as well, just like the physical state has dissolved. And there's an even greater sense of expansion, actually much more of a field effect. That's how it feels. Everything gets very light and energy oriented. The body's still there, but it's there at its physical level like a phantom. And the client on, on the uh, table feels very light often. And what happens now is primary respiration slows down so much, it's almost imperceptible. It's now moving at somewhere around about a hundred second cycle. So it's slowed down four times the speed of that other one. So now it's coming at the body like this. I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to be here for two minutes nearly to show you. And now it's turned into not like a fluid movement, but like an energetic wave, wave big surge through the whole system. And it feels like you're being breathed by something much bigger than yourself. Yeah? So, oh, and then the body, then there can be shift back then suddenly you're back in the kind of fluid state, or you're suddenly back in the physical and the, this structural feeling. So it, it feels like you, you're transitioning between all the elements of who we are. Yeah, that's, and, and, and what seems to happen is the slower the tide, sorry, the slower prime respiration goes, the more powerful the relationship to health goes. So in that wide field, with a very slow prime respiration, it feels like you're in contact with the life itself, and the body gets in, uh, almost infused by it. And you can get automatic shifts taking place structurally. But there's something else happening. There's some reconnection, and the body 
the mind even feels, I don't know, vibrant or resourced. Some connecting to a source takes place. And then the midline feels like it's an energy midline. That's how it feels. And all, what we think is all of these are together. They're all laid within each other. And they just, it, the body unpacks these different aspects of itself in the therapy. So we're getting interested in an anatomical detail, it makes a difference to the sessions to a certain extent. Can I just ask about yeah. Whether, if you work with someone, whether you feel this more structural or that more fluid, feeling depends on both of you together. Yes. You no, you can't just generate it. Yeah, you can't insist. So our approach is to go, touch somebody and go exactly and what do you want to do today? Okay, you want to be in that physical, structural thing, fine, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, now you want to shift to that state. You know, and everybody's different, and actually they, what we say is, the client has the priorities within their system. What you need to be is able to listen to it. So you need to have a kaleidoscopic ability to move through all these different frequencies in your own system. And then you can kind of recognize that. Otherwise, you won't be able to perceive it. You miss it if you want to go through it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you can't perceive that very wide state, they're, they're trying to get there and you're preventing them. Or they're going there and you're not going there with them. And the therapeutic effect is diminished as a result. So it's all become about the practitioner's um, own system relationship. Huge, I think, because in that um, wide field, it feels like a deep meditational space. Yeah. Many people say it, absolutely. Now, as the prime respiration slows and as there's that relationship shift, the mind goes quieter and quieter and uh, becomes completely still in that wide field. There's no thoughts moving. It's not the nature of that space. Uh, yeah. 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 That'd be theta. Theta, so yeah. Sort of exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the the therapist at one end is going. That's interesting about your disjoint down there, and at the other end of their ability spectrum, they're going, "Wow, can you feel that huge stillness that's kind of swamping the room?" It's an interesting mix of skills. And can you feel that as the stillness is occurring, what's happening in your lumbar sacral junction? Because stillness is, that, the, the, the nature of it is changing the structure. And you're, you're, you're able to follow both. So, can it be that the, the client's body doesn't want to go to that more expansive? Yes, and you won't insist. No, no, there's no insistence. No, none at all. Well, what seems to take place is as people start to resolve trauma states and trauma issues in their system, their ability to connect with those states that I just described becomes greater. So often if people are highly traumatized, they might not show you prime respiration. It's not, it's not, it's not evident. The system's so held down or locked down or in some state of agitation that they're actually not in relationship to it. it we, we assume it's there, but it's not manifest. Now as the body starts to change, do some adjustments, you know, maybe it takes a while over a few sessions, but suddenly, ah, there's prime respiration at a physical level. It shows through and then slowly 
these other aspects, these other unfoldments of it start to emerge over a period of time. Yeah, maybe some people don't get that. You know, there's all kinds of factors around what can be, what can make people, you know, succeed. Um, there's also a whole resonance uh, relationship that runs through the system. So here we're looking at the sacrum and it resonates with other structures that are not necessarily connected with it. Yeah, so we notice this. There's a whole aspect of this work which is looking at the way, say, your pelvis and your cranium mirror each other. That's just one part of it. So that's another part of the therapy that we're interested in. So something change. Th th this is how the session goes. Something shifts up here, it'll pause, and then something will shift down here. And that will enable this to then deepen its adjustment. And you get a kind of ping pong match going off. Well then the arm needs to make a shift and then this can really shift in the uh, neck, say. That's how it goes. Here's the movement. It's part of the movement. It's actually much more complex than that, but it's showing an aspect of it. So there is an inhalation it's called, yeah? We think lung breathing is modelled on this. So the first thing you did, we think this comes from conception. The cell does this, there's some motility movement in every cell that as the body's formed has generated a movement along the axis of the body. So up it comes and down it goes and you see the body shapes. As it comes up, the body rolls out. It's wide there, isn't it? As it comes down, the body subtly does that. I mean, micro movements, you know. But we're all doing this, pretty much. We're curling and uncurling and widening. We're lengthening and shortening. We're widening and going that way and this way, and that way and this way, and so on. What that says to me is, in health, we are not static. There is constant motion, and I mean bones are moving here. Everything is in movement. So we are shapeshifters, aren't we? That's what we are. So there is nothing that's static. If there's something static, that's when things go wrong. Yeah. If there's a rock in the stream, it's going to be creating turbulence. Yeah. So in health, we shapeshift and we are amorphous by nature. That's what that is saying to, to, to me. That really revolutionized my world when I realized that. It's a huge thing to say that. Yeah, so what uh, Sutherland noticed was that particularly in some of those slightly deeper tides, particularly that fluid tide, See, I'm saying tide, fluid prime respiration, is, is it felt like the tide? So here comes the flow, there goes the ebb. That's exactly what it feels like. So he called them tides. Now, we're about 75% water. The surface of the earth is about the same. Yeah, so it makes sense that we represent that, really. I mean, that kind of appeals to me and that our fluids are not different than the fluids of the planet, which are moving in a tide-like motion. So we have our own oceans, or we have our own fluid, which is affected by, modelled on the ocean, and that's what we're feeling in our systems when we touch with this uh, therapy. Um, it's a primary energy, yeah, behind it, the, the drive is a primary energy. He called it fluid within a fluid. It's like an impulse. There's a superior, inferior pole. You know, there's a kind of energetic landscape built into the physiological uh, body. And there are spaces in the body which are so energetic, so uh, deeply nourishing that really are explored in this therapy. Uh, there's been a huge interest in embryology in the last 10, 15 years in this therapy, and this, this is one of the big drivers behind uh, understanding 
what we've been feeling for years and not really knowing what the hell it is or where it's come from. Here's a moment, and there's lots of things in the embryological unfolding that help, but here's one of them. End of the first month after conception, you've got an image here showing you how the neural tube and the, um, you know, the developing uh, egg goes into this big flexion movement here. So it's called enfoldment. And suddenly you've got an embryo shape, haven't you? Now what we believe is this was the beginning of primary respiration. That thing that's going like that, that I've been talking about, it starts here, we think. Here's another image showing just that. Here's the neural tube, first thing to appear. There's a physical structure sealing up. As soon as it's sealed up, it goes into a big curling movement, gathers in the yolk sac, the amniotic space flows around it, and you've got an embryo, and then all the, everything starts to form from then on. You know, what we think is, this was the igniting of this movement that we're feeling now, and it's never stopped, and it's an underlying rhythm that uh, everything's built on top of. And uh, here's a, another image just showing that same movement, just showing how everything's kind of very fluid-like, quite hollow at the moment, the body's not filled in yet. See the heart's in situ here, the gut. Yeah, that big curling movement. And here's an animation that uh, John Hopkins University ran over the embryonic and fetal periods of life. So just check this out. Cool, so on it goes, it's on a loop, but what we're seeing there is how the embryo grows right up to birth. So it's the whole embryonic and fetal periods and looks to me like it's doing that, don't you think? There's a whole series of curls and uncurls as the embryo fetus postures and shifts in its growth process. So I think that's what, what that is, is a gross form of what we're feeling. We're, we're, we're feeling the micro level of that, which is happening every 12 seconds. But the body as a whole seems to grow through a sequence of curling and uncurling. And um, the brain grows through that as well. I suspect it carries on, actually. I, I don't have a time lapse, one of somebody's next 50 years, but it'd be interesting to do that, wouldn't it? Yeah, so um, everything grows through an unfolding process. That's what we're with. And uh, we think what we're listening to is the power of growth in people. It's what's made us, it's what's driven us to be like this. Yeah, so it's the creative force uh, within the body. So the embryology is starting to show and explain all kinds of things we're feeling, lots of other things that I don't really have time to go into, but that's one aspect of it. 